Today is Wednesday, July 11th, 2018. This is Layla Voral. I'm talking with Arthur Hooray in his home in Elmhurst for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy that you're doing this with us. So could you tell me a little bit about your early life and where and when you were born and how you grew up? Well, actually, I, I grew up right here in this house. Um, I was born in 1949, uh, so that would mean I was 19 at Stonewall. Um, my grandparents bought this house back in 1920, uh, so basically, you know, uh, it's been in my family, you know, all my life, and uh, I moved back here about 10 years ago. But I would say that uh, growing up in this neighborhood, it was very different. Uh, there were even open fields at the time. Uh, it was a very, uh, I would say, German, Italian, and Jewish, you know, neighborhood. Uh, now it's become ethnically the most diverse <laughs> <laughs> neighborhood probably in the in the country and uh, I I remember my grandfather once saying uh, when I was I think around 13 I had come home from school and uh, he was uh, talking with my, my mother in the kitchen, and I came walking in, went back to my bedroom, to my homework, and I heard him say, you know, I think Arthur's going to be a confirmed bachelor. <laughs> he never, in retrospect, I don't think he was saying I was gay. I think he was just envisioning that uh, there was something very independent uh, about me. And uh, yeah, I would say he was right. <laughs> so tell me, when you were growing up, who was in the house with you? Uh, my grandparents, uh, my parents, and myself, you know, uh, pets that I had, basically hamsters and turtles and uh, there was a dog for a while, <laughs> um, but actually, um, yeah, it was just just us, you know. And uh, you know, of course, my neighbors. Uh, I I had many girlfriends through school. Um, I never really thought about that I was gay because I really didn't know what that was. But I did recognize as, you know, I became a teenager that there, there was something different, you know, but society really wouldn't uh, allow that to come through. And uh, I used to, in high school, I had, uh, you know, that was the time of between you know, the British invasion, of course, with the Beatles and the Stones. And so you were either a rocker or a mod. And I was definitely a mod with the long hair. And actually, I used to get into trouble in school because of, you know, they wanted me to cut my hair. Uh, my mother actually stood up for me. And, you know, in hindsight, I'd say my parents were always very supportive of me being me which is a wonderful thing and actually the the day before graduation I actually cut my hair <laughs> that my graduation cap wouldn't fit I had to stuff it to make sure it stayed on uh, it's kind of a rebellious thing but I graduated it was 67 the summer of love so now I was a I would say I was a hippie <laughs> And there was, uh, I, I would not say, 
I was comfortable saying I, w I was gay, and uh, but as a hippie, and with the summer of love happening, there was a freedom that that uh, bisexuality was uh, was considered perfectly normal under you know at that time. Uh, Gay still wasn't uh, out there, and I didn't really know any gay people, except, again, I feel very fortunate that right after high school, again, my first job, uh, I went to buy tickets for Taming of the Shrew, uh, which was actually on reserved seats, and I wanted to take my high school girlfriend to that. The owner of the theater, uh, the manager of the theater uh, saw me and he said, would you like to have a job? I said, yeah, sure. So immediately I became an usher and that job was actually a turning point in my life because I realized once I was in the theater, I was now around gay people, uh, including the manager of the theater who I suppose, you know, in this day and age, they call this sexual harassment. I, I would say it was mentoring <laughs> because he made me feel, oh, it, this is okay. It's okay to have these feelings. And again, this is 67 before Stonewall. Um, I actually... Uh, I had, was going to college. I went to Brooklyn College. Uh, I decided to major in acting because now I was, my whole world had opened up in a whole new way. And um, I actually dropped out of college in 69. It was in probably like May, just before my finishing my second year. And I remember my acting teachers saying, uh, you're, you're running an A, why do you want to stop? Well, I had applied for the neighborhood playhouse and I got in. And so I was offered a job that if I started immediately, I'd have enough money to pay for, you know, my tuition for that. And and I mentioned that this all kind of leads up to Stonewall because that was June 69. I remember going to Judy Garland's uh, funeral, you know, not inside St. Patrick's, but I was outside on the street with uh, the hundreds of people who showed up. And so... Uh, when Stonewall happened, that was, uh, I was working as an usher at night, and I remember my friend calling me up, uh, who was also an usher, and he said, something's happening down in the village. The police are, they're trying to arrest, they, they raided Stonewall, and they're trying to arrest, uh, you know, these people that were inside, and, and, we're all going down there to support them. And I came down after work. And uh, so it must have been like after midnight, one o'clock about when I got there. And by then, I suppose the, the riots had kind of subsided because now there were so many people there that the police really weren't sure what to do. And uh, it was more like just trying to contain, but I remember coming out of the subway in uh, Sheridan Square, and you could hardly even get out of the subway because there were so many people there. And again, the next three nights, uh, we all just kept coming and having this peaceful demonstration, but just to show our, our solidarity and support. And the amazing thing is that Mayor Lindsay at the time, uh, 
he told the police to back off. And that was the big change that happened. No longer were the police coming into gay bars and raiding bars. Uh, it, 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 and also my feeling, I remember when I came out of the subway and saw all these people realizing they were all gay. And I think that was the feeling that everybody else had too. It's like suddenly we're all seeing each other, you know, and out in the open. And this was an amazing feeling. And Mayor Lindsay saw it too. <laughs> he realized how many gay people were in New York City. <laughs> and uh, I think he even switched from being a Republican to an independent after that too. Uh, but it was a whole uh, opening, you know, in culture. Uh, I remember Christopher Street suddenly shops opening up, now gay owned, you know. Uh, there was gay theater that was coming out at that time. Uh, Jimmy Peach and the Hot Peaches. Um, was a, a, a friend of mine. He's the one who started the uh, Halloween parade, at which began just as a simple, you know, meandering through the village streets with the puppets. And now, of course, it's, you know, the big Sixth Avenue extravaganza every Halloween. Uh, Charles Ludlam and the re uh, Ridiculous Theatrical Company, you know. Uh, I I suppose I should, I my connection with them is when I I became a, a dancer I went into uh, after the neighborhood playhouse uh, I actually moved to uh, Washington D.C. because I wanted to be at all the uh, anti-war demonstrations <laughs> and again. As a hippie, I was living in a, a commune there. Uh, and and also I ended up working at uh, Arena Stage. But I, I came back to New York and uh, continued, uh, well, I wanted to continue, you know, my career. Acting, uh, there were some things that were happening, but Amazingly, when I went to the Playhouse, because acting was what I decided that that was going to be my you know main endeavor, uh, I would really tense up. <laughs> but I'd go into the dance classes and just enjoy myself, and that's when I. So I kept taking dance classes. Eventually. Uh, I ran into somebody who was giving classes and she said, you know, I have a school in Greece during the summer and she gave me a scholarship. So I studied 1971 in Greece and th this was at the same time that uh, uh, Joni Mitchell was there, uh, Leonard Cohen was there, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it was, and she had this school, there was an art school, a music school, and a dance school. And that year, I mean, I really, really excelled as a, as a dancer. In fact, I even, uh, but I didn't know it. I didn't, uh, I was beginning to feel, oh, this is never going to work out. I even wrote to my father. Uh, and the only letter I ever got from my father uh, where I had told him, I said, you know, I think maybe I should quit dancing and, and uh, take up a trade. And he was a dental technician. I thought maybe I should learn a trade like you. <laughs> he wrote back saying, no, which really surprised me. He goes, no, follow your heart. I never forgot that because 
yeah, I kept on dancing. And when I came back to the States, I actually got into this company called Aerodance. I was like 22 and suddenly I, we were in a residency at the Brooklyn Museum. Then we're at the Museum of Modern Art. And then we were going to Paris for five weeks for the Festival d'Autom as a guest of the French government. And I was like, this is unreal. I'm like 22 and like, where's, where's the pain? Where's the suffering? It's like, it's all just came, you know? And yeah, it came, it came later, believe me. <laughs> but uh, that was such a remarkable experience to be in Paris. I, I was like seduced by the city. And also there was a different understanding because remember I ha I haven't really been in New York that much after Stonewall so the changes that were happening here in the city I, I think I saw well certainly in Paris there was much more of an openness you know to gayness or actually just the French have a different openness to sexuality uh, they're not really that judgmental <laughs> and the most uh, memorable moment of, of that experience was the very last performance where uh, it, was, it was actually, yeah, it was our very last day that we were performing. And in the audience, sitting right in the first row, was Picasso and his wife. And, and I, I'm like, up on the scaffold, looking down, I could see him there and realizing, oh my God, it's Picasso, you know? And when we started performing, I could, sen I could sense his excitement because he was squeezing uh, Jacqueline's hand. I, I could, it was, he was almost like childlike. He was like, you could see he was like really excited. And I found out later, this was in 70, Two, he died in the spring of 73. But the last few months of his life, he began doing all these pen and ink drawings of these aerial flying figures. And he came back into my dressing room afterwards, shook my hand and said, bravo, bravo. <laughs> and it's like, that's all he said. And I just remember looking at his, his coal black eyes. It's like he just, pierced into your soul and, and you know this man could truly see and it, it's kind of ironic because here he came to you know compliment me and yet I'm sharing my dressing room with Philip Petit <laughs> who at the time of course had not done the World War Trade Center didn't exist but um Philip Petit used to perform in Sheridan Square. He'd set up his tightrope, you know. So I used to see see him there a, as well. And then when I did come back to uh, the, the States, I was living in, in the West Village, and uh, as I mentioned, Jimmy Peach and Charles Ludlam, because they actually, uh, in the 70s, the National Endowment, thanks to Betty Ford and Jimmy Carter, was like funding the arts on an unbelievable scale. And especially dance. It really opened up dance as a, a cultural experience, especially to the rest of America, that really never saw it before. And I got to travel around uh, the country, you know, and would see uh, how, again, it was very protected for me because I was with my dance group. Uh, so I never felt uncomfortable. But I would see how other gay people, you know, in the rest of America weren't having the, this kind of openness that we were really enjoying now in New York City. And 
a, a lot of that, uh, you know, I, I think dance was like a really a cultural opening. Disco also happened at the same time, which began to bring people out and together. And uh, one of the amusing things I used to find, especially when we went on tour, is how <laughs> many people enjoyed the village people without realizing that I was at the River Club when the village people were found. They were five gay men who came Halloween night in costume. Their costumes were just so great. <laughs> Not that they were great singers. It's just they was they were seen that th this is going to work. This we can really promote this, and uh, yeah, it's like you know when they. You'd be in middle America and, and, you know, hearing YMCA being sung. It's like you, you saw how people loved the song, but they really did not make any connection, you know, of, of what this really was. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. So thank you. That's an amazing, amazing story. I, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to... Take us back to mm -hmm. your younger days. Sure. Um, so when you were finishing high school, actually, even when you were a child, like, how do you remember yourself? Were you comfortable inside yourself? Did you think I'm different from other people? Did did you do you remember when you were attracted to boys and what sense did you? How did you think about that, or was none of that happening? Uh Yeah, actually, I, I, I was comfortable in myself because I remember one of my in the fourth grade, one of my girlfriends uh, were in the in her backyard on the swings, and and uh, and she said, if you could be any age, you know, you wanted to be, what age would you be? And I go, and I was nine years old. I go, well, nine. I'm, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy at nine, and she said, well, "I'd I'd want to be 17." <laughs> but you know, when I think about that, was my answer? Yeah, I was happy with being in the present. Um, as far as boys, I, I most of my neighbors, uh, there were more girls in the neighborhood, and at the time, uh, I was an only child. Some of my neighbors were only children, uh, but I, I do remember that, that there was an older boy who lived like two houses away, uh, and actually, I kind of looked up to him, you know, and uh, I even I, 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 my sexuality, I, I think, I, I don't think I really, uh, I didn't really know, you know, but I did know my, yeah, I had different feelings and, but I didn't, uh, I felt, uh, I, I didn't feel like there was anybody else. I didn't know anybody else, else you know, that had that those kind of feelings. Um, and actually, um, when I started college, I actually went to my uh, guidance counselor there, and uh, she had suggested therapy because I, I was questioning, you know, whether uh, um, these feelings, and not that I wanted to dismiss them, uh, and I certainly didn't want to really change them, but uh, I 
think I was having, the problem was probably not so much with myself as with the rest of society in being, and that's where Stonewall changed that, you know. And as I said, when I started at 17 as an usher, uh, that was, uh, that was eye-opening for me because I realized, yeah, I was, you know, I now had gay friends. <laughs> and were you living in a, in the city in a way that you didn't feel fearful or like you had to hide or like, did you feel like you could be openly yourself at that point? Uh... Yeah, I didn't feel fearful, um, but I, I suppose there were times that there there was bullying that happened, um, but I was never fearful of it because I was never looking for it, or, you know, or expecting it. It kind of would be unexpected when when that would happen. Um, like on the street, somebody would Yeah, there was one time, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether it was in junior high school or something, but actually I, uh, these two boys, one of them was my age, one of them was a year younger, and it was the younger one and I who actually were better friends. And his brother one day saw me on, on the street and you know, had made some comments, and I, and I, and I didn't exactly know what he was saying, but uh, I knew he was like trying to create some kind of confrontation, and I really didn't want any part of that. But it did, you know. It it was hurtful, you know. And especially because I was friends with his brother, you know. And when you look back now, do you realize that he was picking up on something about you? Yeah. And picking up oh, picking yeah. on that? Definitely. Yeah. And I, I never felt uh you know, effeminate, you know, in school and and as I said, I, I always had, you know, uh, especially in high school, girlfriends, you know. Uh, in, in fact, I, sometimes I think guys were, it's like, how come you always have a date? <laughs> maybe girls liked me because they felt comfortable with me. <laughs> and do you remember coming out to your parents? Uh, well, yeah. But not not exactly, but because uh, I I think my parents were aware, you know. Because here I was also having, I was a dancer, you know, going off to Europe, and, and you know, it's like. But there was one Thanksgiving that uh, I suppose that would be the actual coming out, where. Uh, you know, my whole family was kind of gathered, and my mother made a comment of, uh, oh, you know, be nice to, every mother looks forward to having grandchildren. And I turned to her and I, I, I just said, no, I, I've, got to, I've got to stop this. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to happen. <laughs> you know, of course, I never thought about... Uh, adopting children, you know, uh, but I knew I definitely didn't want to have any children. Uh, and how old were you at that Thanksgiving? I suppose that was, I would be probably, hmm, I would have been in my later 20s, I think, you know. I mean, even though I had boyfriends, you know, and lovers, that that my parents were always very open, you know, to. Uh, I even question sometimes whether, you know, maybe my father may have been because his best friend, their relationship through all the years, you know, uh, I looked at that uh, 
and and also you know his best friend I, I would say became a, was a, a friend of mine as well you know and he was open they were you know to uh to my boyfriends you know so there there was there was definitely an acceptance you know maybe it wasn't ever spoken about uh that's really interesting yeah i mean do you look back and and recognize that as being unusual uh there were things in my childhood because my parents had uh my father with his former you know army army buddies they had a a, a house upstate new york in uh so in the summers, I would go up there, and basically uh, my two older cousins were up there. But all the adults that were in this house, um, my parents are the only ones that had a child, me. So I kind of grew up around uh, a lot of adults, and it was a bit strange thinking back on it you know I mean these were good times I was real happy about it uh, I loved going there uh, but the men slept separately from the women <laughs> and uh, I remember Saturday nights you know it's like uh, I used to love going into town to the, the movie theater. And it was this wonderful old uh, Quonset hut, like right out of World War II. <laughs> but that was the theater. And, you know, it was great going to the movies Saturday night. But it would usually be the women that would do that. Every so often the men would go when they had the war films, you know. And, uh, uh, and sometimes my father would, would, would go but often the men would stay behind. And there was one night, I, I had thought about this, that we can't, it was just the, the women and myself that had gone to you know the movies. And we came back Saturday night and the front door to the house was locked. And They said, oh, why did you lock the door? They're like knocking on the door, because they never locked the door. And he goes, oh, uh, you know, Johnny, the neighbor, came over to take a shower, so we were like, you know. And, and I I began thinking, mm, no, here are all these army buddies, you know, hanging around Saturday night, you know, with, uh, and, and Johnny was in his 30s, really, you know, good-looking guy, and I'm thinking, mm, I'm, you know, I, as a child, I didn't pick up on that at all. But in hindsight, I questioned, you know, which is perfectly fine, but <laughs> I think there was, you know, uh, you know, I've even seen this, uh, it's like, uh, because of society that men would play straight even though they may not be and uh, I probably shouldn't say this but I know it for a fact that even in my Buddhist group over the years I've watched how it has evolved uh, and become much more open but originally it came from Japan, which again is a very sexually suppressed society. <laughs> and there were uh, quite a few Buddhist leaders that uh, were married men, but I know were gay. And it came out later, you know, some of them may have divorced, <laughs> but Again, even under that umbrella of, of Buddhism, you know, it's like they were depicting, you know, this aura of, you know, we're, we're straight. 
Let's take a break for one sure. second. You should have a sip of water. Do you want a sip of water sure. too? Mm -hmm. Am I just rambling no, you're, on? No, you're speaking beautifully. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, so we want to ask you some more about Stonewall and sure. kind of the, also the bar scene more generally. Were you going to gay bars in the late 60s? I did. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, not that often because actually, uh, as I said, working as an usher in the theater in a very gay environment, I mean, I was meeting gay people. Uh, I, I probably wasn't as active then. Um, uh, but oh, it was, it was something I, I should bring up is when I left college uh, to go to the Neighborhood Playhouse, one thing I was told in the neighborhood playhouse is that where you do realize your college deferment is going to be canceled. This doesn't count. And of course, while I was there, I did get drafted. And I had no intention of going to Vietnam. Uh, I was seeing a therapist at the time, so I got a, a, a letter from him, you know, saying that emotionally this probably wouldn't be good for me. But I, and of course, I mean, I, I was, you know, I did plenty of drugs. <laughs> I did acid before my going into uh, my uh, uh, physical, and uh, that, but that didn't work because they just, you just go over there until you come down, <laughs> whatever, you know. And because I had to go through the whole physical, but at the very end, um, the sergeant meets with you, and he goes, he's reviewing, you know, your 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 papers, and he goes, oh, I see you you checked the box, you know, and he goes, uh, okay, well, I have one question for you. Uh, he said, you know. Uh, we all have homosexual tendencies. He said, does that mean that you simply have tendencies or are you active? And I said, no, I'm active. He goes, stamp 4F. He goes, this will be on your permanent record. You know, you will always be classified as a homosexual and you will be, uh, you know, always... 4F, and this will be with you for the rest of your life. And I thought, well, I obviously am going to be gay for the rest of my life, but, you know, it, it was like that was the attitude that, you know, that society really looked upon us. And I remember in, when I lived in D.C., a friend of mine in the commune, you know, he was about to be drafted, and uh, I said, just check the box, you know, whether he was gay or not. Uh, I said, no, check the box, and, you know, uh, and, and actually, the, nobody ever asked, ever, you know, what's your, what was your military status, you know. Of course, I wasn't in that world where anybody really would. I also found nobody ever asked for a college diploma. <laughs> uh, but, you know... Uh, and so you said you were an anti-war activist? Oh, very how, much How did so. you come to that? Uh, it had... Well, I, at first, you know, I mean, because I was very proud of my father serving in World War II, and I can see why they are the greatest generation. Uh, but Vietnam, I remember I had a girlfriend in high school that, you know, again, you know, thinking, yes, you know, it's like you should go and support America and, and, and you know, support the, the war against communism. 
but I felt this was this was not a war that really had anything to do with America, you know. In fact, in Vietnam, they they called it the American War because for them it was their civil war, and I just knew that th this is this is wrong, and also my philosophy, you know, uh, that war is wrong. I, war, World War II was very different, you know. We really had to defend ourselves. Um, but this was a war that uh, we were kind of just dragged into and was something else too. Uh, when I was, uh, as an usher, I worked at the Baronet Coronet Theatres and they were adjoining theatres and I was like the doorman in one and when the show was breaking in the other I would have to run it Net right next door, so I just came out right along the wall, ran into the other theater. Well, this was in 68, and I came running out and ran right into Robert Kennedy, literally <laughs> hugging him. <laughs> I was, I, and here I was now, I was 18, I was supporting him, campaigning for him, you know, volunteering, and, uh, and here's my hero, my anti-war hero, you know. And he was like, oh, no, that's okay, you know. He was with somebody, I don't even know who he was with, but he was just walking right up along 3rd Avenue when that happened. And uh, again, that's before I was drafted. So, I mean, that was something else that really just, you know, cemented in me that, no, I'm not going. <laughs> wow. And did you, um, before Stonewall, had you done anything kind of that was, that you look back and recognize as being kind of gay activist? Uh, no. I mean, except maybe I don't think there really was any kind of activism before that. Um, I remember going to bars. Uh, I had, and and often I would go into a gay bar, you know, and actually with a girlfriend, <laughs> who some were gay, some weren't, but you know, uh, we were friends, and and I do remember in the early, you know, before Stonewall, it's like, uh, that's why disco made such a big difference because dancing, two men could not dance together. And on Fire Island, it's like they were trying to flashlight. If there was not a, a girl between you, you know, uh, you were told to get off the floor. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with licensing, you know, uh, but, and did you ever experience a raid other than Stonewall? Um, actually, well, I wasn't in Stonewall when when that raid right. happened. But I, I went to all the protests, right. you know. But uh, actually, there was one bar. I think it was called Danny's. And I actually had just left it when I think the police came in. So I wasn't part of that. Uh, I mean, not that I knew they were coming, but it was just the timing, you know. So tell me more about, about Stonewall in those days. Like, can, can you kind of paint a picture? Like, what did you look like? And did you go with friends? And what did you do when you came out of the Sheridan Square subway? And well, actually, um, I, I, I'm probably, I, I know, I, that night I was working at the theater and my friend, uh, who was also an usher, uh, he's the one who heard about this. He called me at the theater to tell me, he said, you should come down here and, uh, 
I believe, yeah, actually he came and met me at the theater and because uh, he was working at a different theater. And uh, yeah, I took the subway down. Coming out of Sheridan Square, uh, in fact, only the first night was I able to come out the subway station then because after that, all the demonstrations with so many people that you had to get off somewhere further away to get in there because you, you, you couldn't get out <laughs> at, at that place. Uh, I, I, I probably... Uh, Oh, I, I guess I was not not exactly in my. Uh, I, mean, I mean, when I was a hippie, I mean, I was definitely you know the flower child. <laughs> no, I didn't look like that. I, I was just uh, regular, you know, regular guy. You know, uh, I don't think I had. Uh, 69, yeah, I probably still had long hair. Um, and what, what was happening on the street? Were, were you chanting? Were you quiet? What, were, what was happening? There was, uh, well, you know, a, a, it was similar to the anti-war demonstrations. There was chanting, uh, and again, of course, I, I saw this a lot in the, in the anti-war demonstrations, very much uh, animosity towards the police, you know, calling them pigs. Uh, after Stonewall, my feeling of the police greatly changed when they were ordered to use restraint and when I saw that they did, you know. And, and actually, that's been my feeling all along. I've, which, you know, it, it's amazing as, as a anti-war protester <laughs> and yelling pigs to, some, to have this feeling of uh, respect for the job that they do. Because I saw that they, yes, they, they did do their, their job, you know. They, in other words, they were not harassing the crowd, but they were actually there. I, I, it's like protecting, because when you have that many people there, and especially in such an emotional state, you know. Uh, I think we're going to stop and, for a second. And uh, I remember walking around the cemetery, and I was like amazed. I go, look at all these, see, all, all these people died at the same time, you know. April 15th, 1912. Then I realized it was all the people from the Titanic. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I want to ask you, um, after Stonewall and mm -hmm. after that sense of sort of seeing and being seen mm -hmm. in a new way, did you get active in the, in sort of the beginnings of the gay rights movement? Uh, um... Well, I actually, I think I hear your wind chimes. Right, we are going. Okay, so, so I was asking if you got active after after that week, after the Stonewall week. Mm, well, no, not really, uh, because uh, actually, uh, after Stonewall. I did Woodstock, <laughs> and then I went to Canada, and uh, so I wasn't, uh, and then I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse, so basically, uh, you know, I was involved in, in, in studying, uh, and, um, and after that I moved to D.C. I was active in, uh, you know, the anti-war demonstrations, but as far as, uh, you know, 
gay rights activism, not really, except that um, I was pretty much openly gay now uh, and comfortable with that. So that in itself, I suppose, would be kind of, a, you know, an activism. Absolutely. Yeah. Were, were you in New York um, on the first anniversary in the first March? No, actually, I was in. Uh, I was living in D.C. at the time, and uh, and then, as I said, I I was in Greece, living in Greece. So again, I wasn't. Uh, it was probably. Uh, As well, as as a dancer, we uh, it's not that we were doing anything that was really promoting gay rights, but uh, there are a lot of uh, gay people, you know, that were interested in us as a company. Uh, and I, I mentioned about Charles Ludlam, you know, and, and the ridiculous theatrical company. They often uh, would be uh, booked, you know, in theaters on tours that we were on, you know. Uh, and a lot of a lot of college campuses uh, now were were bringing in dance because of the National Endowment. So that was really opening up. Uh, colleges, you know, and, that, and we would teach master classes, so you know, it was exposing America to something that uh, really did not exist before. And showing, look, we're, we're not only okay, but we're beautiful and worthy of celebration. Yeah, yeah, because we're in, in uh, in the dance company, I'd say uh, half of us were probably gay and the other half weren't, but uh, we're all equal, you know. So when when did you stop um, being a member of the dance company? I did it for 10 years, so it would be 1980. Yeah, and, and actually the very last performance I did was for NASA. <laughs> Tell me about that. Uh, it was at, um, it was uh, at, I believe at, at Pratt, and um, but NASA was sponsoring this, um, and uh, that I guess that was my swan song, <laughs> but I didn't stop dancing because actually, uh, then I was dancing now not as, uh, you know, not earning a, a living at it. I was doing it just for recreation because, uh, again, because of disco and, you know, opening up, uh, there, there weren't really dance bars, but there, you know, it's like now you had the River Club, the, the Saint, which was tremendous in the 80s. Um, I mean, I remember the Saint when it was the Fillmore East <laughs> back in the 60s. Um, but again, what happened, no sooner had the Saint opened, that was also when the whole AIDS epidemic came out. And that actually, all the you know, success that gay rights were getting through the 70s, suddenly the whole thing started to, like, this backlash began happening in the 80s. And I, I lost most of my friends during that time. Uh, I actually, I have AIDS. I'm, I've had it for a long time, and I managed to stay off the meds all during that time because I saw the the effects that was happening. Um, 
I'm on the meds now and I'm actually quite healthy, you know, which I'm very thankful about. I, I also, I went through survivor's guilt and, uh, but I also, I, I attribute my being here really to my own Buddhist practice, recognizing that, you know, I'm alive because there, there's, there's a mission, there's a reason that I'm, I'm here. And um, you know, it, I, I remember when I was first diagnosed, I, I was, you know, I, I didn't look at it anymore as a death sentence than the death sentence we all have. <laughs> And unfortunately, uh, back in the 80s, a lot of my friends, it's like, of course, the detection then was different too. So it's like they'd find out and six weeks later they were gone. And this is something that, uh, you know, now it's like, uh, it, it's, it's treated differently. And also, uh, thank goodness, the awareness of, you know, that this is not a gay disease. It's, it's just, a, it's a disease, you know. There was, uh, in this, when was it? It was in the later 70s. Um, I actually, I, I was in one movie uh, as an extra, uh, cruising with Al Pacino. And uh, I got it through a friend of mine who he did have a, a, an actual speaking part. And uh, during that time, it's interesting that the gay community was very against this movie. But if it weren't for, you know, gay rights and, and striving for equality, I don't think the gay community saw that this movie was actually giving us that equality because um, they, they would have demonstrations against the filming and, and they would they would say we'd be filming at one place and then all the protesters would line up there, but then they would put us in buses and buses off somewhere else that they didn't know about because this was happening every time they filmed it. Even the opening night, um, there were people that were, you know, harassing and protesting. And, uh, and the reason they were against it is they said it showed gays in an unflattering, you know, uh, way which really wasn't true it was showing the gay bar scene the cruising scene very realistically which that only came about that kind of freedom only came about uh, because uh, because of Stonewall and Yes, it was a psychological thriller about a serial killer who was gay and killing gay men. But again, it's showing an equality that, yes, you know, we can be just like anybody else. <laughs> and, and Al Pacino was actually quite, quite good in that, you know. But the, the protests that happened... Um, I even had friends, you know, that said, how can you be doing that? It's like, you're, you know, it's like you're, you're being a, a, a turncoat, you know? And, and, and I said, no, it, you know, it's like, it, it's not showing anything. I, I can understand people who, had, who didn't know anything about gay life and if they saw that and thought that's all that it is. But it was only, it was just one aspect and it was perfectly okay. Well, because before Stonewall, there was a 
kind of the early gay rights movement was we have to show that we're like everyone else in the most conventional way. Like yes. we have to wear suits and ties and mm-hmm. women have to wear skirts and pumps. Mm-hmm. And exactly. Yeah. And this was showing that uh, that was a very much, you know, the openness of, of gay life that was being shown. But the fact that they threw, you know, this this psychological thriller, you know, on top of it. <laughs> did you ever go to the trucks in the 60s? I did, yeah. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that or... Like what that scene was like? Well, it was... It, it was actually am- amazing. Because <laughs> I know the first time I was kind of scared, but, you know, friends told me about this. But um, it was a very open situation, you know. And living in Provincetown, we had... Uh, uh, actually, it's called Dick Doc, <laughs> and on on the beach, and you know, it's like in the evenings. That's exactly it was the same kind of atmosphere as the trucks, the piers. When the '80s came, all of that, you know, the city like closed up. You know, the trucks were removed, the piers were shut down. Uh, the baths were closed. Uh, you know, it was almost like uh, going back to what it was once before, you know. That must have hurt. Yeah, it did. And, you know, actually in Provincetown, there was uh, a Stonewall moment in the 80s that happened because the bars would close at 1 o'clock, and everyone would uh, go to uh, Spiritus Pizza. It would be the one place that stayed open until 2. So everybody would congregate there. And the police would try to break up the crowd, you know, um, you know, saying that, you know, it's a noise violation. And, and uh, But one night they actually arrested uh, a friend of mine and uh, um, put him in the police car. But again, it was exactly the Stonewall attitude that happened. We're not going to take this anymore. You know, this is our town too. And they wouldn't let the police car go away. Uh, And again, it went on for several nights. Everybody would gather there. The police were... I think New York City dealt with it better than Provincetown did because, uh, well, first of all, it was a much larger scale that New York was was dealing with. Provincetown, these were, uh, they, they, I, I don't know whether the, chief of police finally said no. It's like, okay, let's back off. Because uh, they did realize, you know, they, they really couldn't bring in more people unless they brought in the state. And and uh, we were allowed to, you know, were allowed to congregate again, you know, freely. And uh, but again, it did remind me very much of the, the incident that happened in, in here. Sure. Hmm. Tell me about becoming a painter. Well, I always kind of painted, even when I was, uh, you know, my, my father painted, and, and uh, so I always, you know, watched him doing that. But he, he did it for, you know, as a hobby more than uh, anything. And he was an incredible craftsman, really. But uh, I, as a child, I remember going down to the village and 
I was like always enthralled with the, the village art show that they would have every year. And so I, I had made a determination I wanted to be in it. And one year I, I actually did get my little booth and, you know, wheel it out there to 6th Avenue and hang up some paintings and, uh, and uh, there's actually a funny story about one painting that I, I, a friend of mine bought it uh, and it was, it was actually two panels that uh, went together as one painting and she had it framed and the frame cost twice as much as what she paid for the painting, but that was okay. But when she was moving, uh, she said it didn't work, you know, with her new furniture and, and you know, the colors. And, and I said, oh, sure, I understand that. So she did what every New Yorker does. She knows all you have to do is put it out on the street and somebody will take it. <laughs> which is what she did. And she said it was gone immediately. Well, she was, she had moved out, uh, where, where she had moved from, they were opening up an art gallery in, uh, in that building. And she, you know, was invited to come to the opening. So she invited me and guess where the painting was? <laughs> It was now in the gallery with a price on it that was like three times what she had paid. I don't know what ever happened to it. And also, I didn't paint under my own name. I used to paint under a pseudonym, uh, Heath Iscariot. And I have, it's a really good painting. <laughs> I have no idea where it is, but it did get a a life of, of its own. And many years later, then in Provincetown, uh, I decided to take classes, you know, uh, which is, it was the perfect environment. It was an art community. So uh, that's really where I did most of my painting. And you painted under Heath Biscay? I did. I only did that, oh, I guess probably while I was dancing I did. Uh, I don't think I had that much work that I had done, but yeah. And there were a couple of paintings I sold under that name, but... But then you went back to Arthur Hurley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and how have you made a living sort of after dance, after being part of the dance company? Well, actually, I, uh, I was, I did catering um, and one of them was, uh, and, and also I, uh, I, I connected, well, I broke up with my partner, this was in 1980, and I needed a job, <laughs> I needed a place to live, you know, and, uh, and the guy who used to come to clean our apartment, he goes, well, actually, if, if you want, you can clean for this woman. He goes, I, I just really can't handle it. He goes, she's an artist, a sculptor. Uh, I, you know, but I'll, I'll tell her that, you know, you're interested. And, and so I went over to meet her, Lila Katzen. She's a well-known sculptor. And I ended up not just cleaning, but basically her, her assistant. And uh, I used to work on her sculptures, polishing and finishing. And, um, and she's the one who actually, she was going up to Provincetown. She had a, a place up there. She said, would you be interested in like opening up the house for me? So I ba basically became her houseman. And that's how I, came to Provincetown and, and ended up living there for like 25 years. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So tell me about coming back to this house to live. Well, my parents passed away in uh, 2000. This is what the siren. Okay. Yeah, 
city light. Ah, oh yeah. Oh, the dog might come out too. <laughs> More city life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No worries. It's good to have a break. So I take it when these these like noises happen, you just edit. That? Um. Well, I think probably for the the raw mm -hmm. footage, it'll all just be there, and it won't get transcribed. Oh. Mm -hmm. But it won't get cut out of the out of the footage because it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. would be in it, of course. Okay. Um, is that your sense? Okay. Yeah, that is how I like So, whenever you're ready, maybe we can start over if you could tell me about moving back to this house. Oh, okay. Um, well, my, my parents passed away in 2000 and 2001, and I maintained the house even though I was living in Provincetown. And, but my partner had to move out of where he was living. And so why don't you come here? You know, because I would come down every month to take care of it. And, and this way, you know, he would be here. And then, you know, a couple of years later, uh, the house I was living in uh, uh, was being sold. So I had to leave. <laughs> And I figured, well, I'm, I should just come here. And, it, you know, it's, I never really envisioned that, you know, as a child, it's like my main desire was to get out. <laughs> but I'm surprised that coming back here, I actually understand why my mother was always happy here the, her whole life. History, memories, you know, it's like, I, 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 it's like walking through footprints in time. And I'll have moments where I, in fact, uh, the other day I actually thought this was really strange, but I actually felt something I said, I bet my mother probably had the same kind of feeling of like, just looking at something here and just remembering the memory that went with that. And, and it was not just me having the memory, I was realizing, you know, that my parents had those feelings, you know, my grandparents had those feelings here, and uh, my partner, uh, I mean, he, he was magical, you know, he, he, <laughs> there were times he actually would say, oh, I, I had a conversation with your mother, <laughs> you know, and knowing him as I did, uh, yeah, I could understand where he was coming from. Yeah. That feels good, huh? Yeah, and the neighborhood is so different now. I actually, I told my uh, tenant, the other day that, that uh, you were coming here to interview me. And uh, he, he's gone, wow, I, I, you're kidding, you know? <laughs> and I said, no, it's really happening. And uh, 
and I was actually very open about, you know, about my connection with Stonewall and being gay. And he goes, well, there are gay people around here. And I thought, really? I haven't seen them. I don't know. But I'm not out there, you know? <laughs> Tell me about the rings on your um, Oh, necklace. that's Keith's. Uh, he always wore the rings and the necklace. And when he died, this was on him. And I, I, I wear it, you know, because he's close with me. I don't wear it all the time, but I wear it. I wore it purposely for this because it was something, this is something that he, he would probably be standing right back there listening to everything. <laughs> we'll assume that he is. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me about um, being Buddhist? How did you come to that and what oh. does it mean for you? Well, that was my other partner, who he passed away in 1990. Keith and I had always been friends, but Charlie and I, we met in Provincetown, uh, and you know, then we met again here in New York at one of the bars, and uh, interestingly enough, on St. Patrick's Day, was when we met, and it was St. Patrick's Day when he died. <laughs> he was Irish, too, so it's appropriate. He had a, a, a drinking problem, to say the least, and one night uh, he came, I was living in the village, and he came in, and he was drunk, and he woke me up, and I was, like, really annoyed that he woke me up, and he goes, oh, I just ran into somebody. I'm going to become a Buddhist. And and they told me, nam yo ho renge kyo And I said, what? What did you say? And he repeated it, and I said it, and as soon as I said it, it was like this white light just went off in my head that, wow, this is, this is it. Well, the very next night, um, I went to do my laundry. And I, I Jokingly, I used to call this the laundromat of enlightenment because he was doing his laundry, and the guy who ran it was a Buddhist and told him this. So I went in. I'm doing my laundry now. <coughs> and and he goes, uh, well, I've got to close up the, the, the laundromat my laundry was still in the washer. I hadn't gotten in the dryer. And I began chanting, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, quietly to myself. And then I, I asked him, I said, look, I, I, I need to get into the dryer. He goes, I'll still be here for another half hour. You, you can go in there while I'm mopping the floors. So I put my clothes in the, in the dryer, and I'm in the back. and. He comes up to me and goes, have you ever heard about Nam Yoho Renge Kyo? Now, I knew this was the guy who had told Charlie. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I was just chanting it so that I could get my laundry finished. <laughs> and he told me about uh, Tina Turner. And I said, yes, I, I know that Tina Turner chants. And... Uh, he goes, well, you could become a Buddhist right now. Well, the very next day I went, got my, uh, you know, Gohonzon, which, which is uh, the scroll that, that we kind of, we, we, it's not outside yourself, but uh, it's your focal point, you know, when, when you're chanting. And... I thought, this is amazing. I immediately went to do this and began practicing. But Charlie, now I was now chanting for him to make good on his word. It took me two years of chanting to get him to accept. But he finally did. But the amazing thing is, I did not know this, but all through my dance career, 
the Gohonzon and Nam Yoho Renge Kyo was in the other room where we had our rehearsals. And and I look back on this as like it's always been there. You know, and again, even in my life where I went to the, the temple, which was actually uh, just blocks away from the hospital in in Queens where I was born, you know, and, and I mean, it's proof that enlightenment is exactly where you are, you know, and it's like you don't have to go traveling all over. It's, you just have to realize, you know, that that truth and I feel that very much being back here I look back on my whole life it's like this may be where I began but I've had this whole incredible life that has happened in between you know so I think of a place that leads me to when we thinking about Stonewall again mm. and it's going to be the 50th anniversary yeah. soon so when you think about that um what do you think? What do you think about sort of the trajectory of your life in those almost 50 years and and sort of what that time has ended up meaning for you? Oh, I look at that. That was a very special time of my life of, of developing, growing, you know, it, it's amazing to have to have the the wisdom and understanding that I may have now, and um, if I had had that then, but of course you you, do, you don't. I mean, that you know, Mark Twain said that your education begins when you leave school, <laughs> and it certainly is quite true. But even even, you know, my own emotional development of, you know, recognizing that uh, loving people does not mean, you know, you, you don't, you don't possess somebody, you know. I, I would say in my earlier relationships, you know, that kind of jealousy would come up. Uh, I think that's what I really learned with Keith, you know, is, is that uh, people, you can, we can be, you can be individuals, you can be who you are, you know, but to truly love, uh, Shakespeare said it the best in, in my favorite sonnet let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love which alters when it alteration finds oh no it is never fixed mark that looks upon tempest and is never shaken and true love is never shaken Yeah, Shakespeare knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so, at least he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> right, we don't know more than that, really. Uh -huh. So what are your um, thoughts, sort of your hopes and your concerns for the future, Wait, sort of from the context of Stonewall and where we are today? You know, I'm actually kind of mentoring... Uh, a young man right now uh, who actually uh, he, he became a, a, a Buddhist and I uh, I invited him to come chant with me and I was telling him you know I, he saw pictures of, of Keith and I said you know my partner had just passed away and uh, and he like blew my mind when he, he goes Oh, I guess I'd have to say uh, I have a, a transgender partner. And I, I thought, oh, I didn't even know you were gay. <laughs> and, and it's like, 
when he said that, that he was, he admitted that was the first time he actually said that to anyone. He hasn't told his family, and and he all, you know, his, I believe his mother thinks that he has a girlfriend. <laughs> doesn't, you know, doesn't realize this, but uh, not only am I helping him as a Buddhist, but I realize I've been able to like help him really talk about being gay. And I said, wow, I'm really honored that you, you know, he felt comfortable enough to share that with me. And the fact that I didn't tell anybody at the time, he saw he can trust me. And trust is like the most valuable, you know, trait you can have with someone. And where now, you know, where we're able to have conversations where um, I said, you, you don't have to come out. You don't have to tell people. The only person you have to tell is yourself. And so long as you know who you are, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, you know. And so I, I'm seeing him become really comfortable, you know, in himself in that. But when you ask me about, you know, my hopes for the future, it made me realize that I have really been actually comfortable in my past, uh, and especially the past two years without uh, Keith, I've been uh, rather reclusive and I even told you know this young man that uh, I don't know how much I can really help you as a Buddhist because I'm not really you know I'm, I'm not like striving for you know I'm not looking for fame I'm not you know I've I've enjoyed those things in my life, but I'm not looking for that now. I'm I'm not even really looking for, you know, a relationship because actually, I feel I still have that. <laughs> it's quite different, <laughs> and maybe in a totally different plane, you know. But, uh, but it's made me aware that. Uh, you know, I'm not really thinking about, well, actually, I, I am. I am thinking about how can I, uh, well, I, I can't do it the way he did, but David Bowie did, I mean, his exit. <laughs> and I'm, like, working on creating my own. I'd like the artwork to somehow, you know, live on um, I would uh, I need to work out a will for sure you know and uh, and recognizing that these are things that now that that's what I'm looking at as the future not that I'm expecting a short life because I have feeling it I'll have a long life I, I, I don't know, it has to do, has to do with my practice, you know, I'm, I'm not through. And, and I think, you know, uh, the fact that you wanted to come to interview me made me very much aware of like, actually there's, there's a real documentation that, that's happening of something, you know, uh, because I've touched upon so many famous people in my life, and I feel really privileged about that. But again, if when one becomes content, uh, you don't really grow, you know. So that can be a real danger. And as a Buddhist, 
that's something that uh, you're, it's always you should always be striving, you know, to grow. Do you think it's important to mark the 50th anniversary of Stonewall? Oh yes, yeah. Why? Uh, well, you know, passages of time, you know, it, it also makes one recognize one's own mortality. Because you go, wow, 50 years, suddenly, you know, and yet it seems like yesterday. But all things, I, even... Uh, I, I, I've just been reading, uh, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy's biography because, uh, again, I met him <laughs> just before he died. And again, 50 years, you know, this year since, you know, it, it, it does bring you to that sense of your own mortality. Do you have thoughts about the sort of the state of the of gay rights? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I really seeing the White House lit up in rainbow colors <laughs> when, you know, gay marriage uh, finally came to be and you know Keith and I talked about getting married the following year too uh, I'm so glad he got to see that and uh, but now it, it, it's like rights equality I, I really you know what what was done in the military with transgenders being kicked out. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's not right. And I really see that uh, there, there could very well be, uh, you know, our rights could be diminished. We have to really, we have to really fight to make sure that, you know, people are equal, that no one group, you know, dominates and, you know, kind of projects their will over everybody else. I mean, I even, like, with, you know, pro-choice and all those who are, anti-abortion it's like nobody is making you do something that you don't believe you should do before we say goodbye is there anything else you want to tell me about oh I've said a lot <laughs> oh I just hope that the world can really come together, people can live in peace, true to themselves, and get rid of the hate. And I recognize, I, I recognize I have actually been filled with a lot of hate myself lately and Chris Cuomo actually did, said a wonderful story the other day uh, on his show where uh, he talked about this tale uh, that uh, this grandfather was talking to his grandson uh, uh, he goes I feel like I ha there are these two wolves inside me one of them is just angry and full of hate and animosity and and is constantly battling the other one which is good and compassionate and kind 
and the two wolves are like at each other all the time and it's like I don't know which one is going to win and the grandson says whichever one you feed and that struck me when I saw my own hatred when I'm yelling at the news <laughs> what I don't want to hear don't want to see realizing that yeah if you feed hate with hate it's only going that's the one who will win and we have to be careful about not letting that happen that's beautiful with that I'm going to say thank you thank you that was so oh, lovely. Oh, wow. Oh, thank so you. so lovely to listen to you. <laughs> wow. Really, thank you so much. Oh.